Okay, hello and welcome to the second meeting of moving monolithic apps to Kubernetes, although the first like scheduled one where we decided to actually make this a thing and keep doing it. Um, like I just said, there is a Google Doc in, uh, there's a link in the chat. Uh, for those of you who have never been on a Kubernetes SIG call before, the, uh, the rule is everybody's kind of responsible for taking notes. So if there's something in there that you think is valuable or somebody says something you want to follow up on, the Google Doc is kind of a place to, to track that information. There's a sort of unwritten rule that you can assign things to other people. So if somebody says, oh, I'll share this repo or something, feel free to like open it up and either assign it to me or somebody else. Um, and as we start the meeting, if you have ideas of things you want to bring up, questions, agenda items, feel free to add those. And the sooner we get the in, the sooner we can sort of figure out how much time everybody's going to have. And we'll go through those, uh, those items one at a time. And that's going to sort of be how we bootstrap these things. If we don't have a lot to talk about, I'll usually defer to the unconference style, um, where everybody just brain dumps and we vote on what we want to do. OK, cool. So to kick things off, um, I'm going to go around and make everybody at least say hi or wave. If you have your video turned on, I'm going to assume that means you're willing to talk. If you have your video turned off, I'm going to say that we're just going to pass on you. Um, but I'll go first. I'm Chris Nova. I work at Heptio. Um, this meeting is of interest to me because uh, I'm really interested in telling the story. And the more I research this sort of like section of Kubernetes of how do we move bigger enterprise applications, the more I realize this, there's not much there right now. And for me as an open source engineer, I've always kind of been one who's like, oh, there's a problem that needs to be solved or nobody's done this yet and you can't Google this yet. So like naturally, I really want to fix it. Um, so that's sort of my inspiration. And then uh, working at Heptio feeds into that because a lot of what I'm going to be doing here is advocating for the community, which is, you know, you guys on the call, plus everybody else in the, uh, the open source community as well. So that's sort of me. Uh, I'm Don. Uh, Don Mahajan, work with uh, Chris, and I'm specifically in, um, I'm doing products here at Heptio, so really interested in understanding the developer perspective and uh, monolithic apps is a special area of interest for me. Cool. Um, I'm going to go across the top. So whatever order you are on my screen, that's the order I'm going to call on you. Um, L Y fit lift lift. Yeah, the uh, name came about before the rideshare company. But what are you going to do about it? Um, <laughs> I, I'm Josh Hall. I uh, am a founder at Farmotive. I, my day job is uh, principal cloud architect at NBC Universal. Cool. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next on my list of people to pick on is Mike Lange. And if I butcher, uh, hey, this, Mike Lange. Yeah, correct. Yeah, Mike Lange. Mike. Mike Lang here. Um, I work for JDA Software, which is a supply chain uh, planning and execution company. Um, I'm interested, we're about to march down this path of moving our one of our enterprise products over to from a monolith over to microservices architecture. Everything I'm seeing is more theoretical in nature, so I'm looking for some practical experience, knowledge for you guys. Cool. Uh, next we have Noah Abrahams. Hey. We cannot. Can not. No, still no audio. I bet you anything Noah's running Linux. <laughs> yeah, is he? Yeah, he is. Like, <laughs> we still can't hear you. Um, how about we, we come back to you? Um, next up, we have Doug Fish. Hey, all. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I am a uh, cloud architect at Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm a container and Kubernetes enthusiast, and we have a, some upcoming projects where we're going to be moving some um, uh, service-oriented code from virtual machines to uh, um, containers orchestrated by Kubernetes. So I want to find out what can go wrong and what can be done to make it right. Cool. Uh, next step, Stephen Fallis. Hey everybody, good afternoon, good morning. I'm Steven, I'm a solutions engineer over at Docker. I uh, work mainly with large enterprise customers around their .NET workloads. Um, traditionally, just getting them into containers, but as, after they get to containers, how can we take that kind of monolithic container and break it out into microservices? It's really where I'm uh, really interested in learning from all of you and being a part of this community, so 
Thanks. Hi. Welcome. Next up, Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia Perfina. I'm also a Docker. Um, I'm developer relations and I, one of those people that write those uh, examples on how to do these types of things and con currently concentrating on moving um, Java apps, um, especially in dealing with sticky sessions and all that good stuff um, into containers and ultimately into, um, into Kubernetes. Awesome. Welcome. Um, looks like we just had Carlos Moldonado join. Hey, if you want to give a quick intro, feel free. Um, if not, we can we can skip you too. He's muted. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I'm in some kind of open space, so I cannot talk a lot right now. Uh, I'm in the middle of a screen share session too, uh, but. Uh, I'm here to share my concerns about migrating a big monolith that we have uh, probably in the next two or three years to a Kubernetes deployment. So that's why I'm here. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Noah, if you want to try again, go for it. Nope, nothing. <clears throat> Still can't hear you. <laughs> Okay. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Noah's going to reinstall Linux and recompile his kernel and hopefully <laughs> get his audio drivers working again. Okay, so our first thing, and everybody, uh, I've talked to you about this kind of, this is where their, their brain naturally goes to, and a few of you already have kind of alluded to this, which is, uh, uh, when does it sort of make sense to migrate? Or more importantly, like, when are you ready? When are you not ready? Um, and in what situation, like, would, you, would it make sense to say, hey, maybe this monolith is actually fine by itself, or actually, no, we're actually going to gain a lot, and here's what we're going to gain in these three or four concrete things by moving to Kubernetes. So I would like to kind of open it up there. If anybody has any thoughts or feelings on things they've seen in the wild where maybe they've been bitten or maybe they, they started to move something over and it turned out to be more trouble than it was worth. Because I've got, I've got a great one I can share, too. Cool. Um, so one of the times where this was kind of uh, weird for me is I, had, I was in a situation where there was a Python application that uh, was very much written to be deployed on a virtual machine. Um, it had all the basics of an application. It had logging bundled into it. Oh, hey, Aditya, welcome. Um, I had logging built into it, and the entry point was like a bash script that wraps the Python, uh, like the Python command, and it had all the command line arguments like hard coded into the bash script, and those were like defining variables at the top. So there was like this nice neat entry point, and this whole thing like made these assumptions that it would be getting HTTP traffic, it would be getting it on a specific port, and then it would like be able to find these other endpoints and route that traffic accordingly. Um, Trying to move that into a container was pretty hard because I got to the situation where I was about nine layers between what I was actually working on and when the actual program started. So it was like I wrote a, a Docker file that then would like call this bash script that then would like call this Python program that called this other Python program that would use reflection to look up the class that, or module that could then actually call like the execute function or whatever that then called some constructor that then actually started my code and for me as a software engineer that was super frustrating and one of the first things I did was rip the entire code base apart and rewrite my entry point um, but I'm wondering if anybody else has been in a situation where something like that has happened to them apparently I'm the only one who's done this so I had a very similar situation uh, with a uh, marketing application uh, that used Kohana. If you're familiar with Kohana, it's no longer, supported, uh, no longer even maintained. Um, but that was a requirement that could not be stripped out. Uh, so being able to write simpler inline environmental variables that could be consumed by the application, um, which would be PHP on the back end, so just as much fun there. 
uh, experience, uh, yours, Chris, and that uh, ultimately looked at what will what will it take to refactor the entire application as opposed to continue to limp along with a non maintained non supported front end. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in my case, I, I was fortunate enough to where I could sort of get rid of all the boilerplate and all the magic going on behind the scenes. But going through that whole exercise, I like inadvertently learned the application pretty intimately, something I didn't really need to do necessarily for the, you know, the task of just get this running in a container. I actually had to go through and like get, get the application running locally, get a database set up, get it, the whole thing to actually like work. Um, so there was a lot of noise that went with that. I mean, this, what seems like a 30 minute project turned into like this, like four day long, oh, I need to download this database and oh, I need to see the database and oh, I need to like do all this other stuff just to get the program to even start. Um, so in that case, it's like, you know, going back to the original point here, like when does it make sense to migrate? When does it not make sense to migrate? Like the benefit we got by moving to Kubernetes was if we needed to scale this thing, we could. But it was also like this huge investment of going through and understanding that an application I had never even laid eyes on before just to figure out how to get it into a container. So one of the things I really have been thinking about is how do we make that easier and how do we give people like best practices on, on getting these containers built quickly? Um, has anybody seen anything like tutorials or tools that can help with this? Cool. I'm going to take an action item to follow up on that. And I, I would like to add the lesson learned that I had was there is a true definition or differentiation between legacy and monolith, right? There are some current monoliths that are running fine, can be decoupled, can be put into Kubernetes. If it's already legacy, it probably is less likely to be a successful deployment. Um, if you are trying to bring legacy code forward that again is not supported, not maintained, it's best to find a way to sunset the old code so that you're not continuing to propagate new deployments of risky solutions. Interesting. Yeah, I think, I think the difference between legacy and monolith is, is really important to, to separate because I usually hear monolith and I think, old Java app that's 10 years old, that's had 100 plus people work on it that we've all kind of seen before. But I guess that doesn't necessarily mean they're the same thing. And one of the things we talked about last meeting was defining what is a monolith. And I know somebody sent an email out about that. Do, do we think that would be a good avenue to go down? Yeah, I see people shaking their heads. Um, one of the things we talked about was what's the line in the sand? Like, how do you know you have a monolithic app and how are we going to break that into microservices? Um, what, are the, what are the correct sizes of those microservices? Like, how do you know if you're too big or too small? I think, I think for me, um, the red flag for a monolith was when we had like multiple people from multiple departments working in the same, same code base. You know, like, oh, I have to, like, go talk with somebody in accounting to make sure that, like, the, the math is going to work out right for when I push this new sales order thing or whatever. Anybody have any thoughts on red flags for when you have a monolithic app? Cool. I think one of the key factors is whether or not decoupling into a microservice allows for value at scale. Right. If you're not going to gain any value from being able to scale something that's decoupled, why decouple it? What, what are you really gaining by separating it out other than having another layer that needs to be maintained? I mean, I, I think like separating it out sometimes is helpful because it starts to like sort of build these mental building blocks of like, here are the seven things I have that make up this one system. Um, and I think once you kind of know those, mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier to reason about your app. So just from an engineering perspective. But yeah, I think just asking yourself as an engineer, does it really make sense to go through this whole thing or are we just like creating another layer of stuff that we have to manage and deal with moving forward? Yeah, I think the challenge that we've got in with our app that we're talking about here is um, 
the trade-off between having these independently deployable, you know, services that are easier to deal with, easier for teams to learn and become proficient at versus the fact we're an execution system and every request we do has to be a sub-second. Um, and of course, the more you decouple that, you know, the little bit more overhead you've got and so on. So, um, and of course, all the challenges around, they come with some of this stuff around eventual consistency, troubleshooting and all that is trying to, we're, we're frankly struggling with that trade off right now and figuring out what's the best approach for us. Which is sort of exchanging complexity of a monolithic app for the complexity of managing small microservices. Yep. So maybe that would be a good thing to explore, which is like, when, as, as an engineer, as an architect, when is it a good idea to break this into a microservice and introduce the complexity that comes with running a microservice? Like, how do we measure that and how do we predict if it's actually gonna be more like efficient downstream or not? Interesting. I mean, for me, like when I think microservice, I always hear people define it as like do one thing and do it well. Um, but it's, I think it's a little bit more than that because in, in a weird way, a, a microservice to me is kind of just a miniature monolith. Like there's usually a data store, it's usually listening, it's usually doing some sort of data manipulation, but it kind of just has a single responsibility. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have any other thoughts on microservice size? Well, I think there's different, and I think there's different sides of the spectrum or different pieces, uh, points in the spectrum to consider, right? So if I look at a monolith sharing a single data store on one side in a true, what I'll kind of air quote, a true microservice where there's, you know, a share nothing approach on the other side, is there something in between that on that spectrum that also may make sense and when does, and when does that make sense? Maybe I'm sharing data, but I have, you know, my business logic is, is segregated or decoupled across different services. You've just described exactly the, the scenario that, that I have I have sitting in front of me and that there's this this you know large number of services that's that's been separated out nicely, except it all ties back to the same um, database, which is not tidy in any way. It's a very ugly database. I don't it would be enormous to take it apart and, and refactor it. If we try to move this into a Kubernetes environment as is, are we going to are we going to see trouble? Are there are there sort of predictable problems that people have done that, that have done this um, could share. This is a really great point, which like, if we have individual components that are sharing a database, is that a sign that that's number one, a monolith, and number two, like, do we need to start asking ourselves the question of, can we pull this data apart and can we separate this into two individual subsystems? Um, which the database kind of seems like a really good way of measuring Number one, microservice size, and number two, letting you know when you have a monolith. In my case, with my Python app, it had a very, it had its own independent database. It was sort of built to be ran as a microservice, and part of deploying that app meant getting that database, that, that problem solved somewhere along the way. Yeah, there's most, a great book out there called Refactoring Databases that I was, I started looking at because there is decent theoretical stuff on how to start to decompose a monolith, but short of talking about you know a, an anti-corruption layer, there's struggles. You know, I struggle with figuring out how do I how do I separate or start to refactor the database side of it. And even though this was run like ten years ago and has nothing to do with microservices, I thought it was a pretty fitting there's some pretty fitting content in there for this challenge here that we've got. Yeah, I mean refactoring a database is like. There's a, I've done it a few times, but it's a whole engineering effort. I mean, we had like the entire engineering team in, in the conference room drawing on the whiteboard and getting kind of passionate about what we should and shouldn't do with our data. And if that's sort of the meat and potatoes of migrating a monolithic app to Kubernetes, like I really think we should start exploring that and getting some concrete data and lessons and do's and do nots around that stuff. Could you repeat the title of that book? Uh, it was called Refactoring Databases, the title. Um, it looks like there's a link to the Google Doc for it already. Oh, excellent. I didn't realize that was a link. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks to whoever added that. Yeah, for sure.
Yay, we're working together so well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think also on the topic of data, something that I see often with enterprise customers especially is they've spent, you know, developer, development teams have spent 10, 15 years in relational databases and are very comfortable in relational data. However, there's times with, in microservices where it's, you know, let's look at some other types of databases and really evaluate is the one size fits all RDBMS the best fit for the application moving forward? Should we take the opportunity to look at different kinds of queues or things like Mongo or other uh, JSON type database, document databases, for example? Um, and so some of that kind of architectural decisions play into should we still be using the RDBMS of 20 years ago today or should we be able to modernize our approach to data while we're doing this as well? That's, that's really interesting. Do we think it would be useful if we had a prototype set up um, on our next call in the future where we like sort of synthesized two independent applications talking to one database and going through like together on the phone, like what we should and shouldn't do when we start to pull this application into two individual microservices and, and running that in Kubernetes. I mean, cause I always learn better, like at the terminal, um, when we have, we have things that we're trying to actually solve. Cool. I, I'm going to go ahead and say that's a good idea. Sorry, I'm going to add this really quick. Are most people using relational or non-relational databases? Relational mostly here. Yeah. Relational, relational mostly here too. Yeah. I'm wondering, like I always think about this, I wonder if there's like uh, any data to support that people who write microservices usually use no SQL, but people who are working around enterprise and legacy uh, monoliths are just using like MySQL and relational data just because it's it's always been that way. Yeah, probably. Um, okay, so I will try to get like a like a repo set up with just like a simple application that like generates garbage data and saves it in like a MySQL database, and we can have another app that like reads from that. Um, and look at re refactoring that concretely. Cool. So just one one thought along that. One one of the things that I'd like to see is do with that when you when you when you pull that together is let's just throw it in Kubernetes and try to manage it and pretend we're going to run it unfactored and see how it fails and and what's unacceptable about it as is. That is that's great. Let's so it's, it's going to be two. It's like the exercise of one engineering, re-engineering the app and actually making the code change, and then two, how do we operate the damn thing after it's running? And maybe even step zero, try to run it as is without refactor. Okay. Right? And see where, oh. see where it falls over. Maybe it behaves just fine. It probably won't, but we'll understand what is the kind of problem we're looking for, where we can see, oh, we haven't done our refactor right because we've encountered this problem or that problem. So I'm just writing this down. So trying to run it as is without any major refactor, just, I mean, create a Docker file, stick it in the container and just, you know, deploy it and see what happens. YOLO. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can start to solve problems. Is there anything anybody can think of that would be like a pretty obvious bottleneck or pretty obvious problem that we're going to hit? Because ideally, if we're going to be writing this prototype out, I mean, we kind of want to like challenge ourselves. Like we want to make it as realistic and as noisy as possible so that we can identify bottlenecks. I think synchronicity would be a good thing to add. Yeah. What's that? Synchronicity. Oh yeah. That's a real good one. Um, what about a failure that is handled sort of like non POSIX compliant? Like what happens if we drop the database, but the code continues to run and we're just like throwing exceptions and something's catching them and we're just moving on with our code. Um, I think that would be a good one. Sort of like a non elegant breaking point of the app. One, one of the common cases with certain monoliths 
is that uh, most developers, if the organization does not have a DevOps practice in place, they won't even know how the application fails in production. So if they lose a node, they don't know if the application is resilient enough for the rest of the cluster to take over the workload and uh, or, or perhaps some of the nodes end up hogging the workload or something like that. And that it is uh, important to have the visibility tools so that the, any developer involved is able to see how along a certain timeline the application failed in production and and they learn from it because it's it's not common that uh, the developers know how their code fails in production and in some organizations where change is really hard to implement. Okay, so what, what I am kind of hearing is like, in some cases we don't really have like a full DevOps team or an administrative operator team. Um, so we just have developers who are kind of blind to everything. So keeping that in mind as we're structuring this prototype and knowing that we're gonna to have to figure out a way to speak developer back to them without having somebody who's full-time focusing on cluster and application operations. Yeah, exactly. At least, or, or how they could be introduced into having visibility into these production systems, you say, because they eventually, it is better if they're involved with it. Okay. And usually uh, what I'll do after the call is like, this is kind of like rough notes that we're, I'm just like writing stuff down as it comes to mind. I'll go through afterwards and like shuffle everything down and make it a little more approachable, digestible for people. Um, so this is great. So just to kind of like replay this action item as a sanity check to everyone, we want to have an open source repo. Uh, I don't really care what it's written in, probably just write it in Java because I feel like most monoliths are written in Java. Um, and it's just going to serve as a prototype, what we're going to use to kind of challenge ourselves and, and push the boundaries of Kubernetes. Um, ideally, it's structured in a way where we can like create new controllers or resources within the context of the program that like make this whole exercise harder. Um, and then we, we can use that as a team to just go through and run in Kubernetes, see what breaks, try to containerize it, and then look at you know, as a software engineer, how would we break this thing apart into smaller microservices? Does that sparkle with everyone? Cool. Yay. It does. Heck yeah. Okay, so I have that recorded. So I'll just go back and like write myself like a proper agile story from the recording. Um, I think moving on, uh, one of the things that I hear about a lot, people ask me about a lot is like, how do you structure the different people who are going to be working on this whole effort? Like, is this a software engineering responsibility? Is this a DevOps? Is this a systems administrator? Um, do we think it would be helpful to kind of go through and talk about number one, what needs to be done? And number two, like who would be the best person to do this stuff? Um, Cause I feel like everybody's kind of different, right? Oh, if somebody is about to say something, please jump in. I was just going to say, I think that's a, a, a great topic. It's certainly one of my concerns. Yeah. Because this team that's been writing the application may have little knowledge of, of containers or, or Kubernetes. And do we, do we augment their team with some additional people? Do we give them some education so they know more? Uh, do we just sort of keep in the dark and have an operations team put pieces around them? I've seen pockets of different things work in different ways, but I'm, it's not clear to me that any of the any of these are, it's not clear to me what the right way to go is. So uh, if you watch uh, Joe's KubeCon talk, he's the CTO of the company of Heptio here. He's uh, one of the people who started Kubernetes uh, along with Craig and Brendan and um, the rest of the Kubernetes gang. He, uh, he has this idea that there's six roles um, segregated into two buckets. Uh, I guess I can probably put a graph in here. Maybe I'll add it after the fact. But there's three engineer-minded people and there's three operation-minded people. Um, and then going from the bottom up, it's like the cluster infrastructure layer. It's like the shared services layer. And then it's like good old business logic application layer. So you have people who code that and people who run that of those three layers. 
Um, would it be helpful if we started to like list out some of the concerns of, of moving one of these monolithic apps and then figuring out who might be responsible for, for doing that? Okay, so let's just brainstorm. What are some of our concerns here? Well, the first one for me, because I'm with somebody talking, no? No, I think Doug mentioned one, so, which was, do they have the right skills? Do they have the right skills? Yeah. Like, do we teach them or do we bring somebody else in? Right. Um, I think there's always this really interesting, like, first step, like, whenever you talk to somebody who's moving to Kubernetes, it's like, okay, where do I get a cluster from? And we're in this like really like interesting window in time right now where clusters are almost a commodity. Like all three cloud providers are like, have said yes to Kubernetes, but that doesn't mean all three cloud providers have like the world's greatest Kubernetes solution that's been around for four years. Like it's still kind of like a new thing. Um, so I think we're like moving towards commodity clusters where a software engineer can just click a button and they don't have to deal with it. But I think in the context of monolithic apps, like there's usually a whole team of people who are in charge of managing the systems these monolithic applications are running on. And it's not gonna be as cut and dry as like, give me just a, a plain cluster on some mysterious virtual machines in a cloud and we're good. So I think there's an exercise of the infrastructure layer. Like where do we get a cluster? What are our concerns as a company? Um, and who's gonna operate the thing? over time moving forward. Let me write that down. And then I think in Kubernetes, once you start looking at cluster lifecycle and cluster deployment, like you open Pandora's box. I mean, it's, it's what operating system do I run my nodes on? What CNI provider? What does my network look like? How do I structure my virtual machines? Do I want a lot of little virtual machines or a few large virtual machines? Um, so I think that's the infrastructure bits. And then I think to go off of what you were saying, Doug, uh, the, there's a human element to all of this, which is, do, do, does, do we start to teach our team about these infrastructure things that they're gonna to need to be concerned with? Or do we like, like vendor that out to a cloud provider or do we bring somebody else in? Curious what people are thinking there. I think that those roles uh, get better defined as you move through the development life cycle, right? Once you're on production, you want fewer people actually hitting specific portions of the application than you do when it's open to everyone in development mode. So not only are the roles, uh, you know, need adequate definition, but there also needs to be lines of demarcation for how the application is supported and managed once it reaches production. Okay. So do we want to look at this from an environment perspective down, or do we want to look at this from a like human perspective? Because I think environments are probably going to be a little bit more meaningful to start with. Okay, okay. I vote environment, yep. I, I also vote environment. So um, let's start off with, where am I in the notes? Um, environments. So we know we have production, and I'm assuming that we have some sort of development or staging environment as well. And we can break those up later, but I think probably best to keep it a bit nebulous because nobody's gonna be exactly the same. Um, Within the context of production, we're gonna probably want somebody there in that space who not only is kind of a Kubernetes expert, but is also probably an application expert as well. Like they gotta kind of have knowledge of what we're running on and then the application itself and what it is doing and not doing. So is, do we think that's one person? Is that a team? Is that a role? Because I kind of feel those are two independent things, right? Like you're the Kubernetes guy or person, and you're like the business logic-y application person. 
Yeah, definitely once it gets to production, uh, if it is a single person answering the pager, right, that person needs to know at least enough about the application to determine whether or not it's at the app layer where the failure is occurring or infrastructure, Kubernetes, whether it's something that is a network-related issue. Um, right. At that level, you can't be solely an expert in, say, the application itself and how the inner workings of, of the app, and you can't solely be infrastructure. You need to have some knowledge or at least a path to escalate uh, in both categories. Or in the case, and we talked about this on the last call, in the case of like the Eisenbug, where it's this sort of house of cards that spans all the different abstractions and we're like in this weird cardinality situation where there's a bug in the app that affects the network that then affects this database that then affects this other part of the application and we're like spanning the entire stack. Yeah. Um, but I still think like for the application concerns, like usually I've seen that is like, let's get a software engineer on the phone. Let's bring somebody in who like works intimately in the code and try to work with them as we play, you know, I'll be the voice of the infrastructure and we'll bring in one of the software engineers to play the voice of the application expert. When you say those words, it sounds like you're sort of, sort of still day to day. They're on separate teams and they're just coming together for this, for this to, to address an issue. Is that a yeah. right understanding of what you're saying? I don't know. I'm kind of like just being hypothetical right now. Um, I figured like pick one scenario and if we can put holes in it, that's going to be a sign that that's probably not the best way of approaching this. In looking at our last root cause, that's exactly what happened. People who do not communicate regularly all jumped on the phone and threw their logs into the mix as quickly as they could. Um, and something that was non Kubernetes related in this uh, failure uh, was hard to reach. That, that, that realization took longer than if Kubernetes logs weren't participating um, weren't uh, provided into the triage. I've I've one hundred percent seen that before. It's uh, easy to blame the new kid on the block. Yeah, it is, and especially like when you're dealing with new software, it's 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 kind of easy to be like, oh, it's all bleeding edge. Like that's clearly where the problem is. We fear change. Right. Exactly. Um, so I think I think this is good. This is sort of evidence in the in the suggestion that people who are worried about production level uptime and reliability should probably also have either their own expertise of the application or work intimately with those who do. Yeah. I think one of the big things about Kubernetes that like kind of attracted it to me when I first started getting into it a year and a half ago, a year ago, um, was that it kind of empowered the developer. Like it kind of gave the developer this like nice pluggable interface where they could start to sort of conquer their infrastructure to use a, one of the quotes from the book I wrote, um, which was this idea that maybe software engineers should start taking more ownership of the environments in which they're running. And that's, and Kubernetes sort of makes that easy and sort of structures these environments and then, you know, as a software engineer would have really appreciated them to be structured. The dark side of that is that it created false assumptions that the operators, the orchestrators, were replaced, were no longer needed, and that's not true at all. Yeah, I think, I think it's just, just their concerns are just now a little bit different. Like before it used to be um, managing virtual machines, and now it's like managing the cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, scenarios that uh, I consider that would probably be valid, it would be as soon as you start building whatever proof of concept uh, environment you have planned, then you should get the developers involved so they start using it. Even if it's just for pushing uh, applications that do, that do not uh, reflect the needs of the business, but at least the, it gets them used to how to push code, code into it, especially if the artifacts are different to what they're doing right now. And then you evolve uh, whatever environment you are developing, you know, if it's Kubernetes over OpenStack or over bare metal or anything, and you end up um, delivering uh, a product in production that conforms to what the developers need in, in some kind of agile way, instead of just putting the ops guys you know, three months to work in a Kubernetes cluster and then uh, delivering it and probably the developers are 
have different needs uh, that they just want some particular kind of endpoints or the authentication does not conform to what they usually do or they're not used to that particular version control system or whatever. Interesting. So this what you just said got me thinking. Would it be, since we're planning on prototyping a monolithic app and we're, we're talking about the problems with the sort of like the separation of who's managing the cluster and who's writing the code. When we go through this exercise on the next call, would it be helpful if I kind of was like, okay, here's my code, you guys go run it and like see what happens. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to like just totally with 30 guys under the bus, but like uh, keeping that in mind even as we go through it would be pretty interesting just to see, uh, you know, where, where we're going to start to like butt heads and where there's going to be these mysterious black boxes that nobody kind of has an answer to. Yeah, that's that's a way to handle it because, for instance, let's say that uh, they're usually uh, they just deliver RPMs and chef cookbooks, and then you want to receive a Docker instance, and they yeah. don't have that. Yeah, exactly. And then I think it's like, okay, do we need to get the engineer on the call, or do we write our own Docker image, or you know, if we do start to write our own Docker image, what are we going to miss or forget, or write our own Docker image, start to build our own container. What are we going to, uh, to mess or forget, or like what's going to break? Yeah, what ports do the, what ports does the application need exposed and things like that? Exactly. This is all good stuff. Um, let me write this down before I forget. While you're doing that, I, I have to ask a question that's that's come to my mind that may be unanswerable, but it sounds like some of these discussions make it sound like there's a relatively small variety of applications that are being run in a typical Kubernetes cluster. Like, you know, it sounds, it, what, what I'm hearing sounds like a handful of services. Is that, is that really what's going on? Um, I would say that if we look at the types of applications that we see people running in Kubernetes, there's kind of two big buckets, which is the, the small stateless microservice app and then there's like the big stateful, we need to like save data and actually, for lack of a better term, get shit done app. Um, I think the first is significantly easier to run. Uh, and I think that's a lot of the story that we're seeing today. I think there's a ton of work that has yet to be done in getting databases up and running and like managing those databases. There's a really great question, like a thought exercise I'd love to point out, which is like, Pretend you're a MySQL operator and you have a master and a slave with a very common MySQL setup running in Kubernetes and your master breaks, what do you do? Like, there's not a good answer for that today. Uh, other than hopefully you have some like in-house custom software operator controller thing to go and, and, and like detect that and take action and do something for you. Or we're back at square one with, as a systems administrator, you need to go and like, start manually tweaking your cluster to, to fail over to your slave. So I think, you know, when you start to look at applications within this context, like the small stateless ones are really great. They work really well. But the whole problem space I think we're dealing with on this call is the bigger ones that have those more interesting set of concerns. Does, does that, does that kind of answer your question? It does. Yeah, that, that's fair. and that, That's helpful to help me uh, line up the right perspective and, and why I'm hearing what I'm hearing. It makes more sense now. Thanks. Yeah, 100%. And I don't want to pick on Kubernetes because literally my entire job is to talk about how amazing Kubernetes is. But like, I, I think it's important to stretch the boundaries. And, you know, we're real people who are looking at running real apps. We should start to figure out what this is going to look like. Okay. So going back, uh, screening back a few minutes, we were talking about environments, we were talking about production environments. Um, we haven't really talked about development and staging and we only have about 15 minutes left on the call. I have a feeling once we start talking about the development environment, we're gonna start to walk down the path of CICD. What does that look like? When do we drop a container off in prod? When do we drop it off in dev? Do we like go through this process, run it in dev, and then click another button and it goes through and runs in prod? Uh, I don't know if we want to start going down that rabbit hole now or if anybody has anything else they really wanted to bring up this week. Otherwise, I'm happy to go down the staging 
I have what might be a small question in that same space. Sure. When we talk about production dev and staging, are, are most people using distinct clusters to separate those out or, or, or are namespaces brought into play? This is a fantastic question. Um, when, I've done, when I did this in the past, granted this was 1.5, Kubernetes 1.5 when I was running Kubernetes in production, uh, we had each team manage their own cluster. And then when we looked at moving it into production, we, we started, this was right when namespaces were kind of like, uh, I feel like they've always been around, but they were just kind of getting to the point where like our back was getting important and we were starting to really explore like taking advantage of the namespace sort of philosophy in Kubernetes. Um, we started off with everybody had their own cluster and then we amalgamated everything into different namespaces in production. That turned out to be a really, really bad idea um, because most of the teams were like setting up their Kubernetes clusters in such a way that it worked for them that when it came time for everybody to deploy their apps, it was like, no, no, I have a Git repo that does interpolation of my YAML that I use, you know, keep back to apply. But like, oh, but we use Helm. Oh, but like we, uh, we wrote this software that actually does everything for us and like builds our apps out of our Git repo. So everybody kind of had a different solution and trying to munge all that together in one cluster was kind of noisy. Um, I think, Either approach is probably fine and sane, depending on you and your company. Uh, I think the lesson I learned was whatever you do, do it uniformly throughout the process. So if you go the namespace route, like dev and stage should follow those same paradigms. These sound like issues that would have arisen either way because people were, it sounds like what I hear is different, different deployment methods were, were in use. Yeah. And it's not going to work well, whether it's, multiple namespaces or separate clusters, right? Yeah, but the reason the multiple deployments came to be in the first place is because everybody had their own cluster. They had to figure out how to get their app into. Got it. Yeah. So Got if it. we would have had one cluster that we were very prescriptive about, and maybe one person was like, this is the cluster, this is your namespace, this is how you deploy, we probably wouldn't have been in that multiple deployment situation. Got it. Yep. Our that experience is that we tend to have a sandbox, which is a free for all, right? It is the most open, the least uh, restrained, uh, but with significant quotas to keep it from auto scaling out of control. And then we have anything that is non production on a separate cluster. And then production is one cluster. So that, you know, it, it sounds, Chris, like you extended, well, it works on my desktop too, it works on my cluster. And we kind of ran into exactly the same thing. 100%. By giving a sandbox and saying, hey, look, knock yourself out, right? It's the Wild West. You can't hurt it because we're not going to restore it if you do. People began to take ownership of it. Yeah. Another thing that I think encouraged the I'm going to write my own deployment solution uh, mentality was the, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here. We had a lot of, I can't think of the word right now. We had a lot of different developers developing in a lot of different ways. Some people had their personal Kubernetes cluster. Some people used MiniQ. Some people like built it on Raspberry Pis and ran it at their desk. Um, going from your local workstation to running in that cluster was an intimate process for every developer. And I think most of those developers would get accustomed to some methodology and then wanted to apply that to the broader cluster solution as well. So interesting to think about, like, do we be prescriptive or do we let developers have creative freedom? And, you know, at what is the cost of that creative freedom? Mm, I am I'm not a friend of that kind of creative freedom when it comes to deployment. I mean, you're just, uh, you should just provide a place, uh, CI, CD, where mm, you put an artifact or you, you send some uh, uh, pull request and uh, sorry, a merge request and then someone over some kind of automatic testing uh, decides whether that goes into an environment or not. Then after it passes a certain amount of tests. Otherwise, uh, mm, I don't know, that, that 
creative uh, initiative might turn into just uh, every single team pushing or deploying applications in, in different ways. And then if, you're, if it doesn't uh, comply with a particular test, then there's a bottleneck because it, it failed somehow. And it comes to communication, I think, but uh, I'll rather handle it uh, if it passes the test, it goes in. And if you're, uh, if you want some kind of different way to do it, just propose it to um, and the, the deployment um, architecture could be open, and then people could suggest changes uh, if it's uh, defined as code in the same Git repository, right? right? That's that's at least what I think. I think if you offer somewhat sane, low friction defaults, people will usually happily go in that direction. It's when they hit friction that they go off and create their own crazy, amazing uh, things. So I think being not necessarily being prescriptive, but making sure you have a good, sane, supportable default is, is the way to go. And if someone really wants to go off and do some crazy thing, they need to then make it work with whatever you're doing. So if you know you say a default is you doing dev in Minikube with your Docker port mapped up, then if you want to do something else with Raspberry Pi, go ahead, but it's still going to need to work with our integration steps when we're doing pull requests into the GitHub or whatever. And ultimately, I don't really have an opinion where you are running what cluster uh, you know, design or implementation you're utilizing. I just need to you to abstract your variables from the application itself if you're developing the application so that I can manipulate that in the various environments that I'm running it in. Um, helping developers to learn the appropriate way to code their application differently is just as important as providing the right method of moving through the software development life cycle. Yeah. I think there's definitely something to be said. I think Kubernetes aside, but you kind of hit a really soft spot for me, which is like, when I was sort of like a more junior engineer, I always coded applications for me, the way I wanted to see them as a software engineer. Like here's my configuration file with everything I care about as a software engineer. But learning that you're actually coding for an administrative minded person or an operated minded person or, or any of these other people who are truly running your apps, to me, that's like one of the big steps from, you know, junior engineer to more senior engineer. Um, and I think, you know, if we can bake that into the prescriptive Kubernetes moving your app, here are like the, the boilerplate, you want these, you know, 10, 15, whatever configuration that's pulled out. I think that's gonna be really handy to kind of get right sooner rather than later. Bam, good. Um, let me write that. We want to prescribe good uh, configuration dials. Okay. Anything else on the subject? If not, I'm going to spend the last five minutes wrapping up and maybe give us a few minutes to get ready for our next meetings. Cool. Everybody looks good. Um, so action items. Oh, create a Slack channel if one does not exist. This is great. Do we want one in Kubernetes? Cool. Uh, anybody have any ideas for Slack name? Because I, I don't want to pick it out because I feel like if I pick it out, I'm going to like forever be held responsible for picking a bad name. Hashtag monolith works for me. <laughs> OK. Um, is everybody in the mailing list? Because I feel like right now, this is a good way for me to reach everyone with, with data and information. OK. Uh, I will talk to George and we will get a Slack channel set up in the Kubernetes Slack. And I will start to work on prototyping a monolithic Java application for our next call so that we can, we can break stuff and, and start to really see what, what this thing is going to feel like. If anybody has uh, opinions or wants to get involved with the prototype app or see how I'm doing it, I will um let's i'll just put it on the mailing i'll put i'll email out the repo to the mailing list so people can check it out and i'll try to just do live updates like twitter slack the normal noisy communication channels 
And Chris, is it a fair ask to carry forward agenda items that were not addressed within the hour? Uh, yeah. What uh, specifically did you did you mess? I want to make sure I get it next time first. Uh, mine was uh, the length of a pod in production. Yes, exactly. That one there. Okay. So I think that would be really a lot of what's in there is relative to large organizations, the matrix, who owns what. We discussed quite a bit of it, um, but actual failures as a result of pod legacy or, or pod age uh, is definitely something I think would be worthwhile for yeah. this team to, to evaluate. 100% agree. And I super apologize. We didn't get to it today. I was oh, kind no of Okay. Um, yeah, I will, I'll make sure we start off with that one next time. And uh, I am also thinking I want to kind of put together like a graph start just where we can start maybe collaborating on kind of what you were saying, uh, like the different environments and the different roles contained within those environments, just so that we have a starting place so we can agree and disagree with it as we, we talk about these moving forward. Uh, one of the things that I learned from Danan Jay was it was really handy to give these roles nicknames. So maybe next time we can spend some time talking about these different roles and people and what they're doing. Um, but of course, we'll, we'll start off with like the pods in production because I think that's a super good topic. As long as we don't name them after whales, we'll be fine. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> We're running out, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So these are great things for next time. Uh, again, if anybody has anything they want to bring up, uh, I'll reset the agenda so you can just type stuff in. You can send an email, hit me up. We'll, we'll keep chugging. Cool. Well, we have two minutes left. Thanks, everybody, for joining. See you guys in two weeks. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.